Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Today, Nahum. Nahum uh, actually uh, means uh, compassionate, or it means counselor. I like to put them both together, uh, a compassionate counselor, because that's what our father is when he speaks with us. You remember Nahum, of course, comes from, uh, this is what the city of Capernaum, through which Christ would uh, visit so ever so many times in his ministry. And... Uh, taken from that particular name uh, in the um, Hebrew tongue. Okay, chapter 1, and well, let's, let's say a word about this. Jonah was instructed of God to go to Nineveh and preach salvation there, and with the whale uh, burping him up on the beach in front of, no doubt, some Assyrian fishermen, and they worship a fish god, they think they've got God, the Savior, with them. And he had no difficulty in converting Nineveh, the capital of, of Assyria. And at that time, um, Jonah was very um, put out about it, as you well remember. But time has marched on. And incidentally, this is, I think, the seventh and the last uh, a minor prophet book that we will have before the captivity, dated before the captivity. But Nineveh, apparently the, the conversion didn't last because God is very angry at them at this time. So he uses Nahum, to, uh, this compassionate one, to bring the uh, news of the destruction of Nineveh. So having said that, so this book basically addressed to Nineveh, well, um, that then means I've got to say a few more words. Our Father teaches us by types. In other words, as it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, all these things happened as an example whereby we would know at the end. So as it was in the beginning, so it shall be at the end. So that makes these, though some would say it's only history, very important because the Assyrian is always a type of Antichrist. In other words, that that the Assyrian accomplished, and this has nothing to do with the Syrian people. This has to do with the, um, um, the uh, leader at this time, and certainly Sennacherib, I believe, the first or second, second, is the, the man that was the type for Antichrist, not the Syrian people. So, having said that, that's why it's important to you. It lets you know how it's going to be in the end. So, chapter 1, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, verse 1, and it reads, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite, that is to say, Remember that Nineveh means the abode of uh, Ninus and the, the home of a false god. And ultimately the type is it's the home that symbolizes the false Christ. Not geographically speaking because the false Christ naturally elevates himself to the place where Christ himself would sit were he present because he's a copier. Verse 2. God is jealous, jealous, and the Lord revengeth. Now, I want you to make note. Uh, our Father is very emphatic here because he will repeat this uh, revengeth uh, more than one time, letting you know the strength of his anxiety. The Lord revengeth, again, for emphasis, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Now, that says a great deal. Many people are actually afraid of God. Did you hear what that said? I mean, yeah, that was tough. Revenge, 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 jealous, furious, full of wrath. 
against who? His enemies. Then I would ask you one question. Are you God's enemy? The answer, of course, is no. Then you don't have anything to be afraid of. Because uh, you could be standing in the very center of uh, a nest or a troop of his enemies, and he's not going to touch you. He's rather going to bless you, even if he destroyed all the others. So ease your pack down, take five, and loosen up, lighten up, and enjoy your Father's word. You have nothing to fear from him. He loves you. This is addressed, I want to reemphasize, to and at his enemies. Now, if you happen to be one of his enemies, and he will give you uh, a description of what that takes, uh, basically that would, he's jealous. He doesn't want you to put some other savior in front of himself. It's not going to happen. Okay, so, verse 2, 3, rather. The Lord is slow to anger. That means he's got lots of patience. And great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds or the dust of his feet. I mean, when he stomps through, uh, he accomplishes whatever he chooses because, quite frankly, all these things are his weapons against the enemy if he so chooses to use them. Verse 4. He rebuketh uh, the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. I mean, he can put you out of business. Bashan, and that's really a fertile place, languisheth. That means it wilts, it dries up, it withers on the vine. And Carmel, do you know what that means? That means paradise, park, beautiful place. And the flower of Lebanon languisheth. It wilts and dries up. In other words, God controls nature. And God utilizes nature to work his will uh, along with other things. Naturally, uh, when the word whirlwind is utilized in verse 3, that should call to your attention, you that know the horses of uh, the Bible, that is to say God's horses, and vehicles, and you begin to have a little deeper understanding in conjunction with the book of Ezekiel chapter 1, as well as other chapters, uh, the meaning thereof. Verse 5, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. It, um, it convulses the earth... Um, um, implodes itself. Uh, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. You know, there are a set of mountains that uh, you've seen two documentaries, one on, um, one on um, Waco tanks, just out of El Paso, Texas, plus one other mountain that's on a private ranch, and I won't, I won't name the ranch, but that where actually a formation that he, this exactly describes is how the, the earth just implodes. It's uh, amazing, the power, and it's an awesome sight to see. Verse 6, who can stand before his indignation? Answer, you can. Because he's not angry at you. His indignation is not pointed at you. It, it's important that you note that. And who can abide in the furiousness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, because he is a consuming fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. Uh, naturally, the answer to the question is his remnant, those that love him. They can always stand before him. As a matter of fact, he expects you to place the gospel armor on in place and stand against the fiery darts of Satan, and he is going to protect you. He is your shepherd, and a shepherd takes care of his lambs. You don't have anything to worry about. So uh, one of the things I dearly love about this compassionate counselor is that you can sense and feel the anxiety in our Father's heart. He said, the wicked are not getting away with anything. Don't you ever dare say, well, it seems like the wicked are the ones that make out. Uh-uh. No way. 
and to see the awesome power and presence of God nestling, loving, and protecting those he loves. He's your stronghold. He's your protector. He's the one that you draw strength from. I think the next verse will strengthen that very statement. Verse 7, the Lord is good. It's not bad. He's good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. Your stronghold. And he knoweth them that trust in him. You better underline that word trust. Who? Those that trust in him. That trust him to have the ability to protect you, to bring you blessings, to help in the aid and, aid and fight against the enemy. For you see, this Assyrian, though he sent a savior, Jonah, they have by this time totally, completely rebelled. Uh, I wish I'd put the pencil to it. I'm going to make a guesstimate of the number of years it would have taken. I'm going to say approximately 60, and it would linger on maybe as long as 110 years, 20, something like that, until the actual event would transpire. But those that trust their father have nothing to worry about. You're in, you're living in a very wicked world. As long as you will read the letter that God has sent you of instruction and protect yourself against those that you have no difficulty protecting yourself against. Hey, no step for a stepper. You're, you're responsible for protecting your own home so you don't have to worry about anybody that breaks in. You dispatch them. You know, to the dispatcher, 911 dispatcher, okay? And a word to the wise is sufficient, all right? Uh, you must always, you take care of that yourself, but when it comes to the world, God will take care of that for us. You keep plowing. Verse 8, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. And Nineveh would be just, I mean, taken in. It would be, and what is that darkness shall pursue his enemies? It's the hour of the prince of darkness, even now. Satan is darkness, Christ is light. Keep Christ with you, and you're never in the night, because you're a child of light. That's very important spiritually. Verse 9. What do ye imagine against the Lord? Or how, how can you possibly think to try to defy God? Okay, that's the point. He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up. There will be no distress up the second time. In other words, there's no need for a second blow. One will do it quite efficiently. Uh, I want to I read that all together now and just translate it to modern day English. Who in the world could ever think of defying God because he, with one blow, he'll take you out. There's no need for a second with him. And you can't trust him to take care of the heavy stuff for you. Now understand again, he expects us to use common sense and protect our own property, all right, by the laws of the land, doing always obeying and doing the law of the land, but taking advantage of every law that is written for you for protection of yourself and your family. And um, um, I, I many times have made the statement, as a matter of fact, I was even asked for permission that it be allowed to be played on... Um, uh, BBS, the British Broadcasting uh, Company of a minister, because making the statement, any Christian that would allow his wife to be raped in front of him without kicking the man's teeth right out of his head is not a Christian. They, they like that. And they ask permission to, to put that clip in the, on, for British television. But it's true. You protect your family. Christians are not second-class citizens. Never allow someone to get the drop on you in your own home. That's terrible. Verse 10. For while they be folded together as thorns, 
And while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. I'm going to draw a little bit, if I may. Remember in the last book where they weave the thorns and everything together in a beautiful basket to entrap God's people? Uh, be smarter than that. And what God is saying, have you ever seen thistles and thorns burn, briars? Whoa, they don't last long, but boy, do they make a hot fire. And God says, I'm going to breathe on their woven basket. In other words, that that they have woven all together. And it's not going to amount to a, a uh, what can we say, some terminology. It's not going to amount to anything, all right? Because our God, our Father is able, all right? Uh, I started to say a snowball in July. I think that's what I wanted to say, all right? It just, it won't cut it, all right? Verse 11, there is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Now sharpen up. There is only one wicked counselor, and that's the spurious Messiah in the futurist sense. You don't have to worry about wondering who he is. This is your type of antichrist. Not maybe he would come. And he is a counselor, part of the name of Nahum, but not a compassionate counselor. Now, now wise up for me. Come on, wise up for me. The name of the book, Nahum, counselor, compassionate counselor. Here we have the opposite, a wicked counselor. The controversy is between God, and you're going to see why he is so angry that this wicked counselor would try to stand in the stead of God, showing the world that he is God, uh, to deceive the holy people, all the people. That is to say, Christians, those that seek God and wish to follow him, as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's going to happen. And it's going to happen in this generation. The thing is, are you mentally, spiritually, and physically prepared for it? If you're a student of God's Word, the answer is obvious. You are. You're ready. You're a can-do type person. Verse 12. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet. This word probably would be better translated secure. They really think they've got it made. They're going to heaven. All right? And likewise, many, not just a few, a bunch. Yeah, we're going to fly away. Ha-ha. Uh -huh. Yet, that's what the wicked counselor teaches. Yet, thus shall they be cut down. When he shall pass through. Uh, who's that? Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. I have to tell you that this verse 12 follows actually the 15th verse, but I'm, I'm going to let it stand there. It's actually written to Judah, and our subject is the wicked counselor, and uh, it throws it a little off. Rather than saying anything else that might confuse someone, we're going to pass on to verse 13, and I will reread 12 after 15, and uh, you that uh, um, you will understand. Verse 13, and it reads, for now will I break his yoke from off thee. Hey, you don't have to worry about the wicked counselor. I will break the yoke from off of thee and will burst thy bounds in sunder. There's no way. He frees the people. Learn the truth. The truth will set you free. Because a wicked counselor converts and attacks by false teaching. If you understand the word of God, for he has foretold you all things through the prophets, then you can't be deceived. The false counselor, the wicked counselor, can't teach you rot. You know better. How many people do? How many people know actually what to believe from God's word because they would rather listen to man? Hey, he's coming, friend. And boy, is he impressive. And he performs miracles in the sight of people to impress them. The thing is, can you identify him when he comes? God is showing you how. Verse 14. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name be, that no more of thy name be sown. Not in Nineveh, Assyria, and a Christ, wicked counselor, out of the house of thy gods. 
and there's many in those fake gods, will I cut off the graven image and the molded image? I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. And of course, in Ezekiel 28, God has already uh, sentenced him to that grave. Therefore, there should be no doubt in your mind who we're talking about, because God would not for judge someone before judgment day if it had not happened at the first rebellion of Satan and is recorded for your benefit in Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 18 and 19. Letting you know beyond any possible doubt who this wicked counselor is. Satan in the role of false prophet Messiah. Verse 15 the subject changes. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. Now for your benefit I read verse 12. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, that's to say very secure, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down, those that would try to march through. Uh, when he shall pass through, though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. Meaning his children, Judah, the house of Israel. God will never afflict them again. Once you, once you overcome the attack of the wicked counselor, which is to say Antichrist. How precious the Word of God. How wonderful that He gives us these, this, these historical facts, events that transpired and uh, came to pass that we, all we have to do is, as it happened then, so it's going to happen again. If you ever have difficulty with that, I would advise very strongly that you read the first few verses of chapter 1 in the book of Ecclesiastes which is written to your flesh body. I'll say it again. Ecclesiastes is written to your flesh body, telling your soul, your spiritual man, how to keep the flesh in line and happy. All right? And it stipulates there that there is nothing new under the sun, that the cloud rains, the rain runs down the river, it runs into the ocean, it rises to the clouds, the clouds to the stream, down the river, into the ocean, cloud to the cloud. What has been shall be again. That's what you're being told there. This has been, and it's going to be again. And it's going to be when he has the full um, privilege of playing wicked counselor, boy, is he going to deceive a lot of people. See that it's not you. Chapter 2, verse 1. He that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. In other words, um, Nineveh here becomes, if you would, in a sense, a type of Babylon even, and the old prince of Babylon. Verse 2, for the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob, kind of took his power away, that's all 12 tribes, house of Israel, house of Judah. As the excellency of Israel, for the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. Uh, and you know something? It is real sad that in this generation, when much of this has happened, because, you know, who, who is the vine and who is the branch? Christ is the branch, you're the vine, and God does the pruning. Okay? There are a lot of people that don't realize there's a heritage connected with that. So in a sense, they're already marred because they don't know what branch. Oh yes, but by adoption, uh-uh. God didn't waste his time writing these uh, promises and covenants to a people that are supposed to perform them for no reason at all. I will say no more on that. Whosoever will, whomsoever will. Whoever comes to him. Verse 3. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant, valiant men are in scarlet. 
the viciousness of the battle. Got it? The chariot shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. What a shaking is going to take place. Verse 4. The chariot shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the mighty lightnings. Boy, if you can only imagine what it's going to be like when the supernatural arrives with their chariots. Chariots of fire, you bet. They run to and fro on the earth. People are not mentally or spiritually equipped. I'm talking about the, in the futurist sense now, as well as the historical. Five, he shall recount his worthies. In other words, the king is going to uh, bring in his very wise men to say, hey, where did we go wrong? What happened? They shall stumble in their walk. They're never going to make it. They shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the defense shall be prepared. What good will it do? There will be no cover for them. You cannot hide. All right. Verse 6, The gates of the river shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. You know how, you know how difficult it is for God to open a gate? No. What good would have a gate in the river have been during the flood of Noah? Okay. In other words, it's no step for him. He can arrange it. The wicked get away with nothing. Verse 7. And Huzab be led away captive. She shall be brought up and her maid shall lead her as with the voice of doves tabbering upon their breast. Uh, that means uh, the cooing, you know, the love talk. Uh, there is uh, quite a distinction and quite a different uh, view upon this particular verse by many scholars down through the years. But um, Huzab, there was a land named Zub not far away, and some think it was a, the, there was a stream there, and they think it has to do with it. But no, th this is the Queen of Nineveh, all right? The Queen of Nineveh, a type you would if the Queen of Heaven the old multi-breasted uh, uh, deity in, in um, traditions of men down through the years. Uh, only she's not good. And she woos and sings the sweet love song, you'll be all right by and by, fly and fly. You'll be just fine. Good, sweet little old queen Babylon. The harlot of harlots that worships the wicked counselor, that can think he does no wrong. And not only does she worship the wicked counselor, singing that song that is written in the great book of Revelations, I said a queen, I am no widow. Because she married the wicked counselor. That's why she wasn't a widow. God's bride through the son when he died on the cross left them a widow but there's still a wife and there's a little difference for the deeper scholar between the wife and the bride as it is written in Revelation chapter 19 about verse 7 a different subject for a different time but here sits this old queen of Nineveh or the queen of heaven if you like deceiving and making it sound so religious with the peaceful dove, and as much as the dove is also symbolic of the Holy Spirit, she puts up a front, a lie. She is religion. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a reality. Don't let her deceive you with her beating of the breast and the tabbering of her sweetness as the sickening sweet uh, words come from her lips that you're safe you're saved you don't have to understand God's word because you're saved uh, the only trouble is she'll lead you to the bed of the wicked counselor the first one taken from the field is taken by Antichrist not Jesus 
Have you been deceived? Think about it. Many of you have known there was more to God's Word since you were a child and you've been taught. Why? Because you weren't taught God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Mature in His Word. Verse 8. But Nineveh is of old like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away. In other words, Nineveh of old has a pool of water that would last the army throughout any type of siege. Such a wonderful, cooling, refreshing, refreshing place, power in water. Yet they shall flee away. They're not going to stay there. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. When God is ready to frighten, God is angry, God will revenge. And I'm talking of the future now. Look at the example of the past historically. Did they stand? Of course not. And the, what, what it's saying is they had the fort, they had the, 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 um, the food, the water supply, everything in good shape. But they ran. Verse 9. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold. For there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture or vessels of desire, so to speak. What does this mean in the futurist sense? The one world system. The one that controls the market, so to speak, and kind of makes it a little rough on those that really work the nations that are really uh, aggressive in inventiveness because of the blessings of God and perform well to bring their standard of living down whereby it will fit with some place where maybe they don't work so hard. And it's called the one world system and it gathers in much riches but it will, it's the hidden dynasty of the economy. It'll disappear in one hour, one day, one amount to a hill of beans at that time. So again, don't worry. The wicked get away with nothing. Absolutely nothing. Verse 10, she is empty and void and waste. That big water pool is drained. And the heart melteth and the knee knees smite together. And much pain is in all loins. That means they really need to go and there ain't no place to go. Okay? Literally. I think our father has quite a sense of humor when he's ready to come down on the wicked, okay? And the faces of them all gather blackness. It's paleness. I mean, if you take my description and the description in the verse, then see what it is they want and what they can't, I think you can understand the look on all their faces, all right? It's coming. See that you're not a part of that crowd. Don't listen to the old queen of heaven or the wicked counselor. That's to say the false teachers that are the forerunners of tra with traditions of men that make void the word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse truth. So you have to choose for yourself, my friend. Where do you get fed like that from God's word? I don't know. There's some good ones out there. Find the good one and stick with it. Because we're in that generation where these things, these that were types, will fulfill for you're in the generation of the fig tree. We'll pick it up here in the next lecture. Don't miss it. What a letter from our Father as to what will happen to our enemies. Okay, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please?